What's crack? Big dogs. Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas, and this is B D G E. The other day, two days ago, three days ago, all the days get mixed up for me in the summer. Weeks turned into months. Months turned into years, and years will eventually kill me. Thankfully, put a short out the other day about three of the riskiest first round picks this year in 2021 fantasy football. Shorts, for those of y'all that are unfamiliar or haven't watched them yet, are these 60 second clips. So they're basically YouTube's version of TikTok, right? You're seeing it on Instagram Reels are, are popping off. TikTok's obviously a wildly popular platform. YouTube started promoting shorts in which you upload these 60 second clips or less onto the channel. And I like doing shorts for a few reasons. You guys clearly like them. Every time I put them out, you guys are like, I love the shorts. I know it's because y'all asses are fucking lazy and don't want to watch the full length video. We're still never doing timestamps. I don't care. Stop wasting your time commenting. They're also good for the channel, okay? Uh, it helps promote the channel. A lot of you guys watch them. A lot of you guys, you know, subscribe through the shorts. So I will continue to make them because you guys like them. I personally don't love making them because as someone who likes to dive deep on players, someone who likes to dive deep on strategy and really like get into the grit, basically my approach when I'm doing fantasy football stuff is this. Like I do my research, watch film if I need to, get all the takes into my head, and then I spit out a take, all right? It's like a science experiment. You have a bunch of shit going into the input side of the equation and then out spits my output. When I have that output, though, I think it's really important to be able to play devil's advocate for the player or whatever you're talking about. Because especially when you're on a platform like YouTube, I'll be like, I like player X. And then all of you guys will get into the comments and say like, well, what about this, 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 and this for player X? So my job in these videos is to make sure I am ahead of the curve on that. I identify the player I like, and then I identify the arguments that you're going to make, and I make sure I squash them, all right? We clap them cheeks before you can clap my cheeks, metaphorically speaking. So I needed, I felt like I needed to dive a little bit deeper into this short that I made, which is the three riskiest first round picks in 2021 fantasy football so with that being said we also have a major announcement after the intro uh which is going to be fucking awesome for one of you guys out there so stick around tuck your shirts in it's hard to do with a belt on but i have to have a belt on because the button popped off on my pants anyways fuck you stop yelling and let's eat <laughs> Okay, so before we get into the three riskiest first round running back picks, y'all know I have partnered with Underdog Fantasy this year, okay? It's the best place to prepare for your drafts. It's the best place to do your best ball drafts. It's where you can literally draft with me. Underdog is the absolute goat as not only a platform or service, but just as a partner for me to work with. Underdog is giving away one free spot in our BDGE NYC draft weekend, okay? Y'all might have missed a few of the videos bike bike a couple weeks ago basically every summer the end of august we have 11 subscribers come out to new york city we rent out a baller airbnb and we just party from friday to sunday okay i show you all a good time i show you kind of a day in the life but also probably a day in the life on steroids times ecstasy in new york city manhattan kind of like my typical weekend we obviously have a fantasy football draft it's a high stakes league buy-in um it's like a 250 dollars buy-in league we do a live draft together uh, you, 10 other subscribers, myself, and then the entire Big Dogs team will obviously be there for the weekend. So we just hang out. We get to kick it. We get to know each other. We do some fantasy football stuff. We drink a fuckload of margaritas. And it's an expensive trip, right? Anyone who's actually in the house, anyone who's staying for the weekend pays a pretty significant fee in order to come into the league and hang out with us for the weekend because a uh, weekend in New York City, that shit ain't cheap. Underdog is the absolute goat because they are going to be paying for one of you guys fully fully okay they're going to be paying for your trip to new york to hang out for the weekend for the buy-in for the league the two thousand dollars that most people pay to get into this done completely paid for zero out of your pocket zero out of your pocket like you got good health insurance okay here's how you enter you go to underdog you download the app the app will be the first link in my description okay when you deposit ten dollars on there you're going to use promo code bdge okay you're going to use promo code bdge that's going to get you an extra $25 on top of the $10 that you just deposited. So you're talking about $35 in your account from the rip plus the entry into the NYC draft weekend giveaway. I'm telling you, this is literally a $2,000 weekend. You can ask some of the people that are in the weekend this year. They had to give me that money. It is real shit. Also, for those of y'all that are going to complain, like I signed up last week. Don't worry. 
anyone who has used my promo code this year, BDGE, in the year of 2021 is automatically entered into the giveaway. So you are also backdated into that, okay? Anyone who's already signed up, but more importantly, if you sign up from now, this is gonna be open for a week, maybe two weeks at the latest. Uh, the draft weekend is August 27th to the 29th, okay? So that weekend, you gotta be open. That weekend is coming quickly, which means I need to choose somebody. So that means probably less competition for you because it's not open for that long. When you go to underdog, underdogfantasy.com, you download the app, the link in the description, use promo code BDGE when you deposit $10 on there. Not only are you getting $35 on your account and you could do like 11, literally fucking 11 drafts, but you're entered into the NYC draft weekend giveaway. Okay. You have to be 18 or older in order to come to the weekend. Unfortunately, I don't want to fucking be getting arrested for, for margarita grooming minors, you know, shit like that. So don't, don't even fucking bother, please. One of y'all are getting brought out here for the weekend. Uh, all thanks to underdog. I love you underdog. That's how you enter underdog fantasy promo code BGE when you throw $10 or more on to the account. Also Jackson Kane, who won the monkey knife fight giveaway last year, uh, hit me up, please. I can't seem to find your contact information anywhere. We're going to hang out next week when animal comes to film fade the public. All right, let's get into fantasy football talk. I apologize for the long intro, but I wanted to plug that because I thought it was a very cool giveaway for y'all. As I said before, uh, I wanted to get more into the grit of the three players that I chose for the YouTube shorts. So let's just start off with the ADP of the first round right now. And this is per underdog. So you have C-Mac, Dalvin Cook, Derrick Henry, Alvin Kamara, Ezekiel Elliott, Travis Kelsey, Saquon Barkley, Tyree Kill, Jonathan Taylor, Stefan Diggs, Austin Eckler, and Nick Chubb. Based on ADP, those are the top 12. Now, you can say or do whatever you want with Austin Eckler and Nick Chubb. Now that Rodgers is officially biking Green Bay, Aaron Jones and Devontae Adams are going to jump above those guys, and they will push Eckler and Nick Chubb out. So if you thought they were risky for whatever reason, we're not really going to argue that point. Moot point, okay? Jones is going to jump up to like 107 probably, and Adams will probably be right there as well. I think once you hit 106, it's kind of fair game on Jones, Adams, Kelsey, whoever the fuck you want to take. So Eckler, Chubb kind of out of the running there. That leaves us with a couple wide receivers, and it's really, really hard to make a case that any of the wide receivers are risky, right? Tyree Kill, Stephon Diggs, Devontae Adams. They're all going to get a hell, a lot of targets. They're all tied to good quarterbacks. They're all going to put up a lot of yards, receptions, touchdowns, all that kind of shit. So I would say no wide receivers are risky. Uh, if you want to look at it from a team building or a game strategy theory standpoint, having a high-end uh, running back is the most advantageous thing you could do in fantasy football. So it's more like risk by subtraction than it is actually risky players. So we're going to talk about the three players I named in the actual video. The first one is Saquon Barkley, who's going off the board as the 106. Now the injury news is getting weirder and weirder by the day. Now it's it's very possible that they're just keeping this close to the vest where, you know, you under promise and over deliver. That is business 101. We're hearing a lot of reports. Maybe he's ready for week one, but given the timeline on the injury that we know from scientific backing, it's possible that he's not ready for week one. He's starting to slowly slide down the board. Uh, and again, he will probably drop below Aaron Jones and Devontae Adams, given the injury news. Now, the knee injury, as we've covered before, was a big one for Saquon Barkley last year. It wasn't just the ACL. He tore a few different things in the knee, which meant that they had to wait for those other things to heal, for the swelling, for the inflammation to go down before they can properly go in and fix the ACL, which pushes the recovery timetable bike a little bit. And we all just want to throw Saquon into that Adrian Peterson tier. We all just want to throw because he's so physically gifted. We just say, oh, he can come back like no one else has come back before because he's so athletically gifted. But we just don't know. We just don't know uh, what's going on inside of his body. Now, there haven't been any setbacks as far as we know. And again, when asked if he will be ready for week one, Saquon says, we'll see. When Joe Judge was asked if he'll be ready for week one, saying he said, we're taking a long term approach to it, which is interesting when you start to break down like the long term approach to it let's let's peel like the curtains a little bit on Saquon and his history and just the overall history of rookies signing in the first round etc cetera, etc cetera. Saquon was the number two overall pick in the 2018 draft you know ever since they made that pick the pick itself has been fucking laid down like a cardboard box stepped all over and just shit on by football twitter 2021 will be Saquon's fourth year of his rookie contract. When you are a first round draft pick in the NFL, you're automatically signed to a four year deal, four year deal with a team option. You cannot negotiate a rookie deal extension until after the third contracted year. So they could start extension talks right now. After the third year is done, you can start your rookie contract extension talk. When I say team option, so some of you guys might not know the difference. You might just hear team option, player option. It's pretty simple when you break it down. A team option says he's on a four-year contract with a fifth-year team option. Basically, after the four years, the team gets to decide whether or not they want to 
continue the contract based on the terms that they had at the beginning, whatever the money is, they, the team has the option whether or not to re-sign them for the fifth year. If it's a player option, you know, if say uh, I signed a three-year player, a three-year contract with a player option on the fourth year, the player says, okay, I want to continue this option or I can opt out of the fourth year player option. Um, basically, you sign the contract and then after year three, you have to decide whether or not you're going to put him on the team option and extend him, right? So after the third year, which was this year, the Giants had to choose whether or not that they were going to lay down the fifth year option on on Saquon. They obviously did so. So everyone from the 2018 class was a first round pick. Teams had to decide at the end of last year whether or not they were signing the guy to a fifth year option. You have to be a pretty terrible fucking first round pick in order not to get a fifth year option because it's team friendly. The, the contract, the money that they're giving you is still on a rookie contract scale. So it's still very team friendly. So in order for them not to want to pay you a discount while you were a first round pick of the 2018 NFL draft first rounders, nine players did not have their options picked up. Josh Rosen, Leighton Vander Esch, Billy Price, Rashawn Evans, Hayden Hurst, Rashad Penny, Terrell Edmonds, Sony Michelle, and Mike Hughes. With that being said, again, they're taking a long-term approach to Saquon because they have him tied up through not just the end of this year, but the end of 2022. And they'll probably start to negotiate a contract extension relatively soon if they still think the position is valuable, which it's Saquon Barkley, so he's going to command a contract somewhere. Um, but again, they they probably going to want to see him healthy back on the field before they start negotiating the contract extension. And while I do think Saquon will finish strong, it's going to be tough to stomach the first month of the season with him if he's even playing, right? The range of outcomes for September this year for Saquon is like missed games, miss week one, maybe miss week two. I, we don't know how serious this is, right? Like we're getting closer and closer to the season and still hearing these discouraging reports, man. So he can go from missing games in September to playing by week one, but very limited. It's just hard to see based on reports that he steps on the field at the start of the regular season at 100% because you compare the reports between like Joe Burrow and Saquon Barkley right now, and they're literally like schizophrenic. Joe Burrow is full go, 100% keeled from his rehab, stepping onto the field for training camp and doing everything that he normally would do. Obviously, they're different positions, but that just tells you that his rehab went really, really well. He's ready to go. Or on the flip side, Saquon is not even close to that. And we're a month, a month and a week away from the start of the season. Okay. So very big concern for Saquon Barkley. And we know, we know the bigger concern here is not just like a missed game or two. It's not just being at 85% for a week or two. The biggest concern here for NFL players is that these motherfuckers go so hard. If you step onto that NFL field at less than 100%, while everybody else is 100%, right? We don't predict injuries and we don't say players are injury prone. But if you step on the NFL field at less than 100%, the likelihood of you re-injuring yourself is much higher. That's not a guess. That's just a fucking big fact for y'all, okay? So unless Saquon is fully healthy, which it doesn't seem like he's going to be at the start of the season, he is a very risky pick this early in the first round of fantasy football drafts. Saquon, number one. Again, y'all, if you're enjoying any parts of these videos, if you've been a listener or a follower, or sometimes you just happen to click on my videos and you're not subscribed yet, do that, please. Hit the subscribe button down there. It'll throw a D on the end of it, okay? Subscribe once you do it correctly and hit the thumbs up button while you're down there. Next up, after Saquon Barkley on this list was Jonathan Taylor. Now, I like JT and I think he'll probably end up being fine as a first round pick, but this video is all about the riskiest picks in the first round, right? Like C-Mac, not risky. Dalvin Cook, the shoulder is a little bit scary, but I don't think he's that risky. Derrick Henry, not risky, right? These are the guys that I think are the riskiest picks in the first round. Doesn't mean you shouldn't be taking them, but you should be able to acknowledge that they are risky and the risks are real, okay? So for starters with Taylor, we got to split backfield, man. He's obviously the starter. He's going to get the early down work. He's going to get most of the goal line work. But Naeem Hines is very, very much still entrenched into the pass catching role. Like last year, 77 targets, 64 catches, 200 or 482 receiving yards, four touchdowns. That was top three in all of those cat categories amongst running backs. And that has kind of been the theme of his career so far. 2018, 2019 was a little bit of dip, but 2020, right, Mike to be in the, the, the pass catching back there, man. And I think that's not going anywhere. He's a, he's a top 10, top five receiving pass catching back. And I don't mean that in efficiency way. I, just, I think he kind of stinks, to be honest. I don't even know if he's actually as good as Jonathan Taylor in the receiving game, but they're going to continue to force him the ball. The other uh, risk involved in taking Jonathan Taylor outside of Naeem Hines taking a lot of the pass catching work still. Marlon Mack, is he back? It obviously remains to be seen if after his torn Achilles, he can be an effective player. 
But let's not forget, like two years ago, Marlon Mack rushed for over a thousand yards. I'm not ready to write him off. I know all of the history suggests that running backs can't come back from it, but we've seen it. Most of them are old dudes. Most of them are old, way out of their prime or never really had a prime. So they're not as explosive, as good of an athlete as Marlon Mack is. We've seen a lot of athletes. I know we're going to keep like zoning in on the running backs have never done it, but we've seen wide receivers do it. We've seen plenty of basketball players. Kevin Durant's as good as he's ever been coming back. We've seen a lot of athletes and I know running backs need it more than whatever, whatever the case may be. But it's it, it's very possible that Marlon Mack can play this year, man. It happened in week one. He's had a full 12 months to recover from it. And Indy loves this kid, man. Indy really, really likes Marlon Mack. Like, don't forget, it was Mack's backfield before he got hurt in week one last year. Completely his backfield. Taylor was just a breather back at that point. While I do think this is the smallest risk here, because the likelihood of Marlon Mack being a real presence in this backfield is small, it's another thing to note. And while the pass catching work is likely going to Hines, the question also remains, what type of volume do we see in the pass catching world for the Indy running backs? Because we're going from Rivers to Wentz here. And Rivers in the Indy offense last year threw the ball to the running backs on 25% of his overall throws. That was the third highest rate in the NFL. And this is just a constant theme for Rivers going back to his time with the Chargers two years ago, 2020, third highest. 2019, he threw to the running backs on 32% of his throws. That was the single highest rate in the NFL. The year before that, 27%. Okay. Huge, huge numbers going to the running backs. So we have Carson Wentz coming in. And we don't know what type of uh, dip off and overall volume we're going to see in terms of passes to the running back position, but it's probably going to be significant, man. And that might, you know, listen, that might come at the expense of Naeem Hines' targets. I don't know, but it's still a very real risk for Jonathan Taylor staying stagnant on that side of the fucking ledger, his, his targets, his volume, whatever. And that could even decrease. And that's going to be a problem right here. I think best case scenario is that he sees the same amount of targets and receptions and just sees an uptick in volume in the rushing game. That point, he'll return value for you. But there's a risk that it doesn't happen. And speaking of Carson Wentz, like what if he's just broken? What if he's a broken quarterback? OK, that's another risk for Jonathan Taylor. And this offense just stalls out more often than not. I would like to say I'm not on that board. I'm not on that train yet. Right. Like Carson Wentz, I think, will be much better or at least at least like average quarterback in the NFL behind a much better offensive line. The situation last year, anyone would have struggled behind that Philly offensive line because everybody was dead on the line. Okay. Another risk. And and last year, lastly, lastly, the last risk I see with Jonathan Taylor is he stunk in the beginning of the year. He fucking stunk, right? From weeks like one to eleven, he was bad. And then their schedule, their schedule was equally bad as Jonathan Taylor was in the beginning of the year. From weeks like 12 through six, whatever it was, that stretch that y'all know about with Jonathan Taylor, the schedule was against some of the worst run defenses in the NFL, like Houston twice. That was historically, I think, the worst run defense in the history of the NFL. He was facing defenses that were so far out of the playoff picture that had really nothing to play for. They're not about to put their head down and try to tackle Jonathan. It's a business decision at that point for most defenders. So that's another risk. Like, what, how good really is Jonathan Taylor? Everything about his prospect profile tells us he's really good, but what he did in his first year at the NFL, not really, really that impressive when you start to put context behind it and uh, when you start to factor all these risks into his first round price, it gets a little shady here, man. Taylor, very good, uh, very good player, but I'm starting to question his ADP a little bit more and more as we get into the offseason. And then the third and final guy I have on this list, which was the most controversial, which is why I really was inspired. I'm feeling fucking inspirational right now. And shout out to uh, I was at a park yesterday working out and there was these dudes. It's like a it's like a handicap park. And there were these dudes in wheelchairs playing basketball. And afterwards, they came out. Let me make sure you guys can see this. They came out and they were doing fucking pull-ups in their wheelchair. I took a terrible video. But they were all ripping off like sets of 8 to 10. There was a girl there ripping off sets of 8 to 10, man. And uh, and that shit is just fucking inspiring. Because we're out here complaining about fucking Jonathan Taylor and his pass catching work. And then you see these dudes who have just taken the biggest hit in life uh, and they don't give a fuck. They're out here looking more ripped than me. They're out here looking more ripped than dudes with actual leg power, man. And, uh, that's the kind of, that's why all y'all would be like, move out of New York City. And I'm like, that's the kind of energy you can't really find anywhere else, man. Um, and that shit is just so inspirational when you see stuff like that. So I'm feeling fucking inspired today, okay? And I was inspired to talk about Alvin Kamara. And I realized this is actually a hot take, I guess, after I posted it. And there's a ton to dissect here. I'm going to try to do it my best without yelling at you guys. And I know the first thing on all y'all's minds is going to be like, with no Michael Thomas, that means Alvin Kamara might see 100 and. 35 targets okay that's very very possible but i want to lay out my case here for why he's a very risky running back in my opinion for 2021 fantasy football now we have drew Brees gone which uh, initially led me to believe james winston was going to be the quarterback under center then you have michael thomas likely going to be out 
if not limited for basically the entire season. Okay. That's, that's how I will put it right now. You can hear the, you could listen to the optimistic reports of he'll be back by week eight, but I, I would almost guarantee you if we see a fully healthy Michael Thomas, it's not until like week 13, we see the same shit year in and year out with these wide receivers that injure this, injure their feet this late into the week 12, week 13, week 14 is maybe when we see a healthy Michael Thomas, but that is the entire fantasy football season for the most part. So with Michael Thomas out, it started to lead me to believe Taysom Hill would be the quarterback under center. And then we started hearing rumors, reports that most of the league also believes that Taysom Hill probably is the front runner now to be the starting quarterback for the Saints. It makes a lot of sense because when you don't have Michael Thomas, right? When Jameis Winston is leading this offense, Jameis, it's basically like you had, you had ketchup and you had the, the, the burger, the cheeseburger, right? And now with Michael Thomas gone, you're literally just left with like a plate with ketchup. On. And maybe Adam Troutman is like a pickle. And Traquan Smith is like a slice of fucking tomato. And Marquez Calloway is is a piece of shredded shredded lettuce. And fucking uh, I don't know. Kwan Baker is a gluten free bun. So basically, without Michael Thomas, this offense is left with a gluten free fucking tomato pickle ketchup sandwich. That ain't what you want to be eating. Okay, it's not what this offense wants to be. Now Taysom Hill is like a margarita in my humble ass correct opinion because Taysom Hill comes with a lot of upside margaritas come with a lot of upside you don't actually know what you're going to get you don't know where your night is going to go you don't know where the meal is going to go but it's exciting brings excitement to the table okay you don't know if I'm going to score the mark of 4.2 but it's got the ceiling of hitting like an 8.7 you just don't know and I think Taysom Hill brings that to the offense and I think they need that without Michael Thomas in there man otherwise they're going to be a shitty passing offense that relies too heavily on the ground game but if what I'm thinking comes to fruition if they're real life Taysom Hill being the quarterback, here are the problems. If Taysom Hill is on the field, like, okay, if Michael Thomas and Drew Brees being gone, it's possible that this offense just stinks, man. I know it seems impossible because Sean Payton and Drew Brees have run this thing so fucking purely and so well for so long that you just think, no way the Saints have a bad offense. But without Brees and Thomas, I mean, it's possible that they they have like a 58% run rate, that they're like top three in terms of just overall run rate for the season. They just chew clock. They're boring. They're slow. And they're gross, man. That is risk number one. Risk number two, with Taysom under center, it's less passes overall. It's going to be more runs from him, more runs to Latavius Murray, more runs overall for the offense, less targets overall for Alvin Kamara. That's risk number two. Risk number three, with Taysom, you have questions about what happens on the goal line. Taysom Hill started four games last year, people. Four games, he had nine goal line carries to Kamara's 12 on the year. So on the year, Taysom Hill, not being a full-time player, being a, a quarter-time player, had three fewer goal line carries than Alvin Kamara did last year. You, we, could, we could easily see that number flip where he gets 12, Kamara gets nine, if not more. That is another risk, man. And we also saw it last year, the splits with Taysom as the starter compared to when Alvin Kamara didn't have Taysom as a starter. Now, I'm not going to get too obsessed about like the, the huge numbers on the right side there because a lot of that is buoyed by the championship six touchdown performance. But regardless, those numbers from Kamara under Taysom Hill, 12.95 half PPR, 14.2 PPR that is not a top three four overall pick in fantasy output right like you don't want to depend on that and I mean yeah you could look at the individual games under Taysom and you say oh he got one target here but then he got 10 targets here what can we expect here's the thing like we those are the averages those splits are the averages and uh and it wasn't really that pretty the upside wasn't really there to return you league winning value and trust me I, like I'm not out here saying that I'm fading Kamara if I'm at like number six and he drops to me there I'm going to take Alvin Kamara. I just think he's just so talented. And the chance, again, that the entire offense just runs around giving him eight dump offs a game, him seeing 130 targets this year, it's very real. But you have to acknowledge that this offense can turn ugly quickly. You drink that third, fourth margarita, the beer goggles are there, man. Don't drink margaritas on draft night. Lesson number four. These guys, risky. Lesson number four. Don't drink more than four margaritas on your life night, okay? And that's what I got y'all for today's video. That's with what boop, beep, bop. Okay, I'm, I'm feeling too inspired that my words aren't working anymore. Just to recap, the underdog fantasy squad is giving away an absolutely free spot into the New York City BDGE draft weekend. If you've never been to Manhattan, if you've never been to New York, I'm probably the worst fucking tour guide to have for the first time, but I promise you it'll be fun as shit. And you'll be in a high stakes fantasy football league with myself and a bunch of other subscribers that are probably very like mine it to you. So the only way to get into that giveaway, if you've already signed up on underdog using promo code BDGE, you're backdated into it. You're already into the giveaway fucking pool. But if you want to sign up within, we'll probably stop. Let's stop the giveaway. You're, you're watching this video on July 29th. I have to give you guys time to book flights and figure this shit out. You know, one of you guys is going to be very sporadic for this trip. 
Uh, we're going to stop the giveaway on July 8th. Sunday, July 8th will be the last day to enter for the underdog giveaway. And I would suggest you doing it early because underdog needs to send me over people. They need to send me over like five or 10 guys that I can exchange emails with or whatever, go back and forth with to see if you are fit for the weekend. So again, underdog, download the app. Use the promo code BDGE when you do so, when you deposit $10 or more, and they're going to give you $25 free on top of that, and then that will automatically enter you into the Draft Weekend giveaway. Hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. I love you, and I will see y'all tomorrow on Fade the Public. We're talking about our favorite stacks. We're talking about our favorite stacks for 2021 fantasy football. Love you. I'm out. Thank <laughs> you.